Okay. Good afternoon. This is Chaz Smith. I'm the recent past president of uh, LAI Arizona. And I'm very, very pleased to meet with all of you today uh, electronically. I'm not pleased about the fact that we have to meet electronically, but I'm pleased at the fact that we can meet electronically. Before we get into our program, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank, thank all of you for joining us and also particularly thank our, uh, our panel members uh, for the, them taking their time to be with us today. Initially, what I'd like to do is recognize uh, uh, two of our sponsors that we have today. The first is uh, Colliers International, the company that I work for and have for the last 13 years. I can attest to uh, what a great company it is. I've had the opportunity to work for three different brokerage companies here in the Valley over my way too long uh, career. And this by far and away, uh, the most enjoyable from a people standpoint, from professionalism, et cetera. Now, having said that, and again, thank you, Collier, Colliers International. I'd like to uh, introduce Bruce May uh, from Jennings Strauss, and he's going to give a, uh, a brief explanation of what, what he feels that uh, is important for us to focus on uh, during these <laughs> I overused word, troubled times. Bruce? Well, thank you, Chaz. Uh, and first, let me make it clear that uh, I'm not the expert on, on the fate and future of real estate here. The panel is, and, and my role is just simply to uh, uh, give uh, a transactional real estate attorney's perspective on the role we've paid in the past, played in the past uh, and we need to play in the future to assist uh, our clients and the panel to get to their objectives, because as I see it, uh, we need to reconsider a lot of what we've been doing in the past by way of the documents we've been drafting. I did have a bullet point, but I had to edit it after talking to Chad, so you'll just have to deal with this talking head as uh, grim as it may seem. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the first point, I need to make is uh, uh, the, the contracts really are important. They're not just legalese uh, crowding out the business terms. Um, they really are the grease that kind of keeps the wheels of commerce running. And, uh, uh, you know, the grit that stops the wheels is litigation. And we find ourselves now in a whole lot of litigation. And that's in, in part because uh, we are now facing what was uh, what we would consider the unimaginable. And so we didn't address it in the contracts that were prepared uh, you know, on December 31st uh, are, uh, uh, you know, have failed us in resolving uh, disputes that are now before the court. And of course, are as puzzled as the parties about what to do uh, with what we have in front of us. Um, and by, but when I say contract, I mean that in kind of an inclusive sense, not just purchase and sale agreements and leases, leases being the most obvious one because they have such a long life. Uh, but you know, to, to the extent you uh, take my recommendation to heart that we need to modify some of the provisions to reflect what we're now learning and will continue to learn about the effect of COVID, um, that, uh, that that has to be reflected up and down the chain. Uh, everything has to mesh, uh, but I, that's all I'll address is, uh, the purchase and sale agreements at the end and leases slightly just to make the point uh, and illustrate what kind of provisions we need to address. Uh, uh, and actually, this process of considering the uh, 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 you know, what it is I do, and I've been doing for 40, 42 years or so, and uh, you know, given my resume, you would think I've been doing it well. Uh, yeah, it, it hasn't been until the last nine months I've actually had to think about what it is I do. So let me give you a brief overview of the conclusions I've reached. One is, but think of me as a risk manager 
to the extent that I help the client identify risk, uh, help them assess the significance of the risk and how to allocate it to the extent the client wants to address the risk uh, at all. And it is the, the a risk, you know, it is the client's money, the client's call, not mine. So I will accept whatever uh, determination they make, assuming that we're both on the same page and they kind of grasp what I'm trying to tell them uh, about what it is that's going on. Um, some are risk averse, some are risk uh, uh, tolerant, uh, some are sophisticated, some are unsophisticated. So you Bruce, kind of have to, Bruce yeah. this is Chaz. Um, <laughs> we need to move on. Okay, we, we need to move on to our panel discussion, okay? Oh, oh I'm sorry, I misread my, uh, my... Uh... <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, Bruce. Uh, um, but thank you for that, Bruce. I think all of us are very aware that we need to be critically, uh, well, we're becoming aware that we need to be critically aware of language and, and protecting ourselves, both from the lease standpoint, as well as the uh, as well as a purchase and sale agreement. Uh, very quickly, I'd like to introduce um, Lambda Alpha. If those of you, if you're not a, a familiar with Lambda Alpha, I'd like to give you a real brief summary of uh, the company, or not the company, the organization. Uh, LAI members represent a diverse group of professional disciplines and fields related to the ownership and use of land and buildings. The society's original goal of fostering a closer association with academia and professionals involved with land economics and related fields, well, still valid today, has expanded. LAI provides an opportunity for distinguished practitioners and scholars to come together in fellowship to discuss, debate, and perhaps solve dilemmas involving use of our land resources. We are always, uh, we're always open to new membership. And if you are interested in participating and becoming a member of LAI, please contact either me or one of our board members uh, for LAI Arizona. Now I'd like to move on quickly, if I may, I'd uh, give a, a brief scenario of our background on each one of our panel members. I think all of you had the opportunity to look at uh, the bios that were uh, posted when, uh, when in fact we had, uh, when, when in fact you did sign up for uh, this program today. The first is Pat Watts, uh, senior partner and co-founder of Greenlight Communities and its affiliates, <laughs> Echo Communities and South Point Communities. Uh, she has been extensively involved in real estate and operating businesses uh, since 1986. And I asked Pat at the beginning of this program that the pro product that they're developing right now is what, what they had been referring to as an attainable rental product. In other words, a, a, a new rental product that is between 20 and 25% lower in cost of the tenant for each of their, you know, on their monthly uh, rates. And from what Pat has told me, they are being very successful. We have 12 new properties, is that right? Either open or under, or in, uh, in construction. The second panel member that I'd like to uh, welcome is Jim Peterson. Uh, Jim formed the Peterson Group in 1983, uh, specializing in the development and management of shopping centers. The company has developed over 30 retail projects throughout the state of Arizona and received many awards for design excellence for communities and industry groups. Jim, thank you for being here. Uh, I've, I, I can tell you that I've known Jim longer than that, <laughs> much to his chagrin oftentimes. The, uh, the third panel member is, uh, is uh, was to be Kevin Zerwinski, Principal President of Merit Partners. Uh, he is being, and uh, he, he was called away to, it sounds like a pretty high level at the city of Glendale, uh, high level meeting with the city of Glendale and several others. And I think John Graham is gonna attend that later today himself. So anyway, TJ Weed is John's, uh, I mean, Kevin's uh, right-hand man. Uh, he calls him his man. And 
EJ's perspective on the industrial market, partic particularly on the west side, and now bleeding into central the central part of Phoenix and the Southeast Valley, I think is going to be very, uh, very interesting to for all of us. I think we all know it's it's going gangbusters right now. And third, I third, I say third. Fourth is John Graham, and certainly not least. Uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Sunbelt Holdings. John joined Sunbelt in 1982, became president in 1990, and Chairman and Chief Executive Officer in January 2009. Uh, John's background in asset management, development, and real estate investment provides a solid foundation of knowledge and experience in the, in the uh, real estate field, particularly here in Arizona. And th again, thank all, I want to thank all of you for being willing to participate in this discussion today. I sent all of you uh, questions, uh, so perhaps you could ponder them uh, prior to our, our panel discussion today. And I'd, what I'd like to do is just uh, pose a question and ask uh, in a rotation, uh, get, get your response. If you have none, let us know if you want to interject something or if you want to change a, a little bit of the tenor of the discussion, that's fine too. Uh, the, the first is, um, and TJ, just because you're up there left on, <laughs> and I, I want to put you in a position, a very difficult position. First question is, with regards to COVID-19 and the real estate that we're in today, the, the real estate atmosphere we're in today, is this, in your mind, a new normal or a temporary new normal? Yeah, so I, I think I see this question as twofold. I think there's there's a couple things going on here. One being consumer behavior and consumer habits. Obviously, by necessity, given the lockdowns and the um, you know different rules in terms of congregation and what we can have, I think people have had to modify their behavior a little bit. That's that's created a increase in demand in terms of online shopping and grocery deliveries and that kind of thing. I see that as, um, you know, potentially being a, uh, a new normal, I would say, that people have kind of figured out Amazon is pretty convenient, getting your groceries delivered is pretty convenient. So we think from the industrial sector that that will continue and potentially continue to grow. From a, a, t from a regulation and public policy perspective, in terms of uh, you know what the future holds for uh, you know city ordinance and that kind of thing, I think that's more temporary, and that uh, you know will depend on uh, vaccines and uh, kind of overall caseloads to see what ends up happening there. So I think there will be a return to uh, more normalcy pre-pandemic in terms of public policy and, and congregation and travels in particular. I think is has really been inhibited by that. But from a consumer behavior standpoint, I think there's still some question marks, but from our standpoint, we do see the, the continuation of the, the growth in e-commerce and, and kind of where that's going. Pat? And I, I, I agree with TJ, but before we start, Chaz, I think you may have missed thanking a sponsor, Engelman Burger. And I know you don't want to be remiss in that. So I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Pat. I, yes, I was remiss. And yes, I did miss that. And thank you, Engelman Burger, for being a sponsor today. And oh, they my. are a great firm. So I have to uh, stump for Engelman Burger here. They're, they are a fabulous firm. And thank you for sponsoring. You, know yeah, I, you clean up after me all the time and <laughs> my pleasure <laughs> I, I, I agree with tj i don't i don't have too much more to add to that yeah you know, I, I i think that that was pretty well said on that topic well then, then let, let's shift down to jim uh because i think jim's area of of expertise development operations etc is really <clears throat> one of them that potentially has been damaged well, that's news to me, Chaz. I, I didn't know they were damaged, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's good news. You know, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. I mean, with all the goings on out there, uh, with with COVID and the COVID's effect on the economy, uh, you think everything would be devastated, but we're not finding that. I mean, our projects are well conceived, well located, well anchored, and yeah, we had to do some adjustments in terms of rent deferrals when the COVID thing first started. And there was, there was so much of an unknown out there as to how this would affect our economy, how this would affect our business, 
how this would affect our model. But people began to adjust. And now we may have to go through another round of deferrals, depending on this second wave, if there is a second wave. Uh, but I think we're prepared for that. Uh, but this talk of a new normal, I don't know if there ever was a normal in our business, uh, particularly in retail. Retail adjusts about every four or five years, depending on consumer demand, uh, consumer tastes, and we have to adjust to that. And we have to stay close to our shoppers. Uh, you know, we just, we're not building the product that we built, you know, seven or eight years ago. We were involved in power center development in a big way about 10 years ago. That's gone by the wayside. We're primarily doing grocery anchored retail uh, right now. And that's always been a stable, staple of our industry. Uh, people still enjoy going to the grocery store uh, despite all of the threats from the internet. But the smart guys are gonna figure it out. The smart tenants are gonna figure it out. And I think they're gonna do well. A lot of the tenants that I wrote off about four or five years ago, uh, for instance, Best Buy, I thought that they were going downhill, uh, hit bottom, but they have made a remarkable comeback over the last couple of years. I put a total line in any of our shopping centers. Uh, PetSmart's doing well. Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, another retailer that I kind of wrote off several years ago, but again, are making a great rebound. And I think if we can let these very talented CEOs that have taken over these companies, let them do their job. Don't bind them to a quarterly performance that Wall Street seems to enjoy. Give them a long, give them time to adopt to adapt to a long range plan. Then I think they're going to be okay. So I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but to me, it's like going through a recession. You know, you put your head down, you try to control your cost, but more importantly, you look for opportunities. And that's the way we're trying to thrust forward in our company. Uh, I can't predict the future. Uh, so many times during the recession, I get the question, well, how long is it gonna last? When's it gonna end? And is it gonna get deeper? We don't know the answers to those questions. What we know is how we do our jobs on a daily basis. So let's take a day at a time. And I think, you know, this state's been very good to me. It's been very good to all of us. It's growing like a weed right now, particularly in housing. So that's the good news. And so let's see if we can try to take advantage of that. Well, that's a nice segue into, into, into John Graham. <laughs> Let, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about housing. Let's talk about your perspective on the, whether this is a new normal or a temporary or what, John? Sure. Uh, and I'll start by saying when, as you asked me to do this, I said that I have no idea what the answer is on the post COVID outlook. So, uh, but I'll give you my opinions and, Try to give some support for it, but it's a, it's a, a, I think a big question for all of us. But in general, I'd say I think we're in a, a temporary new normal, and uh, by that I, I think that that uh, uh, that many of the things that we had become accustomed to are things that we still uh, aspire to do, and, and I think we'll come back. Um, I think that uh, the reality is is that the the uh, normal or whatever it is is it's not it's not coming until there's a effective vaccine and it's been distributed and, and people have gotten the shots and, you know, I think realistically by the time it's uh, fully developed, it's uh, been distributed adequately and enough people have it. I think, you know, that uh, we're at least another year, year plus uh, of this, of this wild ride. Um, and then I think, you know, one thing I'd say too, is that uh, if there's a, a industry that's particularly well uh, versed in, in, pivoting it's the real estate business uh, and it, you know it's such a cyclical business I don't think anybody uh, predicted a pandemic or just how radically it would change things but uh, but I do think we're very adaptable uh, animals and uh, so for all those reasons uh, I think it's a temporary new normal and that uh, things will be uh, restored uh, more quickly and more normally than than a lot of people are thinking at this point okay um, John, thank you, and thank for all of you for your, your perspectives. What, one thing I want to point out to our, our, our participants, uh, there is a chat box button at the bottom if you've got questions that you want us to try to address uh, toward the end. I'd, I'd like to reserve about 15 minutes uh, from uh, 15 minutes until the hour uh, where we can address those questions. So if you've got questions, uh, type them into the chat box. You know that uh, John, you you mentioned um, something that uh, this is th this is a question that I've got. 
what do you think, I mean, what, what's going to be the tipping point for this change? Um, I, I think obviously it's, it's going to be a vaccine, but do, do any of you have any, any thoughts on what that tipping point is, what, when it's going to be? John, you talked about maybe a year uh, before we really get back to either the new or old normal or whatever. Uh, Pat, do you want to address that? You know, I, I think what we can watch for that might tell us things are back to, to sort of an, a new old normal. Uh, Peter Lineman, an economist from Wharton, uh, says it's when football stands are, are full again. And I think that is right because that's, the, that's when three things meet. Real safety, it's really safe to go out again. Perceived safety, which is, is an issue. There, there, there will be a lag between real safety and perceived safety and discretionary income. You know, when are enough people working again to be able to afford a football ticket? And so when you think about that answer, when football fields are, when football stands are full again, that is when all those three things come together, real safety, perceived safety and disposable income. And I think that's when we'll be back. I thought that was a great answer he had. Right, well, thank you. Uh, TJ, do you have any thoughts on that? I agree with Pat. I think the only thing I would add is I think in addition to when football stands are, are full again, you can also look at, at corporate travel. And when corporations feel like they're the risk of, of sending employees to different places is back again, I think, you know, the hotel industry, the airline industry, these industries that have been really decimated by uh, the lockdown and, and, you know, the Zoom calls and all the things that we've done to to make uh, you know make the best of what we have, I think uh, that'll really really help as well. So I, I I totally agree with Pat. I think I think the football stands is a good gauge, and I would also add that you know when corporations feel like hey I can send somebody to the office in in L.A. or New York or whatever, and I'm not I'm not worried about doing that. I think that that's going to help uh, the hotel industry, help the consumer spending, all that kind of stuff as well. Okay, Jim. I'm going to take. I'm going to keep an eye on our restaurant tenants. I think that's that's the biggest bellwether for us. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to see our restaurants full. Uh, they've really been devastated, uh, you know, by the by the whole virus uh, by the whole virus issue. And I was talking to one of our tenants the other day, and he says, "Well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I want them to get back, uh, but we're finding that people are getting out of the habit of going out to eat, uh, and they're staying home, and so." We're talking about behaviors that have been affected by the recent goings on in our in our country. Uh, but if you're talking about tipping points, I think we just have to get this year over with. I'm hopeful that Congress is going to approve another stimulus package. I think that's critically important uh, to at least uh, help with all of the people that have lost their jobs. Uh, uh, hopefully the new administration will launch into uh, you know, uh, a direction or a leadership that we can really deal with this, this pandemic on a logical basis, uh, on an informed basis. So I'm hopeful for that too. Uh, but I tell you what, as I said before, I love this state. I love the growth. It's it, Maricopa County is the fastest growing county in the entire country. I think we can all hitch our wagon onto that star, no matter what category of real estate that you're in. So I think uh, the tipping point may not necessarily be an overnight thing, but could, could evolve over a number of months. But I'm optimistic, uh, particularly with the recent announcements concerning a vaccine. It's given people a lot of hope and a lot of it's just attitude. And so let's, uh, let's give a positive attitude and I think everybody's gonna be fine. John, did you want to uh, add in on that? And Jim, thank yeah, you. Yeah, just I'll keep it brief. But I, mine's a, a kind of a macro answer to this, which I think is until we have real and, and sustained GDP growth, that uh, we won't know that there's a recovery or there won't be a recovery. And uh, this is a couple of things that the 31% we saw in the third quarter GDP growth, uh, I think was directly tied to the $3.5 trillion that kept pumped in before that, which I totally agreed that it should be done. Uh, and I like Jim would voice that I hope we have at least one more stimulus package uh, because I think the, the time from here to, to uh, uh, curing this is far enough out that I just, uh, I think we really need to be cognizant of not uh, creating structural damage to our economy, which at this point I would argue has not occurred. Uh, and I think that's, that should be the real asset test we're looking at is, is to keep the engine alive to, to uh, uh, reprime the pump as, uh, as we get through the pandemic. Kind of, uh, 
that's like the uh, tsunamis. If you're out in a boat in the ocean, the tsunami passes, you don't even know it happened, but if you're on shore, it really, really is devastating. I, you know, I, you just wonder, uh, you know, and it's always going to be in retrospect, we're going to be looking in the rearview mirror and say, oh, okay. Yeah, I see where that happened. But uh, yeah, thank you all for your thoughts on that. Uh, let me ask you a question. What going forward, and Jim, you mentioned it, um, uh, product development, um, change in, in the product development that you're seeing now, either from the retailer, from your perspective, et cetera, et cetera. What, what change in product development will you see and are you planning moving forward? Well, I know a little bit about retail, a little bit. I can't claim to know anything about any other real estate category. Uh, but product development, again, our product is, 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 as I mentioned before, it changes every four to five years. Um, you know, we have to, we have to adapt. Uh, essentially, what we develop is a series of boxes uh, to accommodate retail tenants. And we, we're in a continual process of updating those boxes. Uh, but also trying to create an environment through our tenant mix. Uh, we have to reduce, we have to reduce our projects down to a human scale uh, so that people really enjoy the shopping experience. And that can be done in a number of ways, uh, uh, primarily with restaurants. Uh, we're getting into mixed use when we combine, we're partnering on two different projects with a multifamily developer. We combine uh, retail uh, with a multifamily component and that really creates a synergy, it creates a lot of energy for our projects. Now, from a selfish point of view, the uh, Mola family developers, for some strange reason, have difficulty getting their entitlements. Uh, but but we, as people. you're very familiar with this, because we recently did a deal with you, uh, and I'm learning a little bit about the Mola family business. Uh, I know a lot of our neighbor, uh, neighborhoods, particularly in higher income areas, perceive mold of families just maybe a shade above the trailer park. Uh, but, uh, uh, but if we can take the lead with that, they seem to like our restaurants. They seem to like our restaurant, restaurant components or our retail components. And by the way, we're partnering with a mold of family developer. So if we can sneak this through, then we're, everybody's going to be happy. But, but again, there's certain tried and true fundamentals to retail development. You have to have a strong anchor, a good location, you know, the kind of trade area demographics that are suitable for the tenants you're trying to attract. But beyond that, create an environment where people really enjoy the shop. And I, those fundamentals have been, have paid off well for us over the years. Uh, and I think we'll continue. And we're going to, as long as we abide by that, I think, uh, I think our company is going to be in pretty good shape. PJ, do you want to, you want to uh, add to that? I'm sure you do, because I'm certain you guys are, are rotating now. Yeah, so I can I can talk a little on the industrial side of things. I mean, obviously, you know, our firm is primarily focused on industrial. Um, so from an industrial perspective, from 2017 to 2019, uh, we were seeing about a 14 and a half percent growth in e-commerce sales. Uh, that represented 16 percent of total sales across the United States uh, in in 2020 and going forward to 2025, JLL is uh, projecting 20% growth in e-commerce sales and having that grow from 16 to 30% of the total pie, if you will, for the, the deal. What that equates to in dollars perspective is going from $602 billion of sales in 2019 to 1.5 trillion of, of e-commerce sales by 2025. That The metric then, pertains to warehouse space and warehouse uh, need based on that is that for every billion dollars of sales, uh, they anticipate that there's 1.2 million square feet of additional industrial needed. So based on those metrics, JLL is projecting that industrial warehouse space is going to need to increase across the entire United States by a billion square feet uh, from 2020 to 2025. So obviously that's a huge driver in our business. The other thing that's really driving our business is in, in Arizona in particular is manufacturing. Uh, what's happening in the manufacturing space is that uh, more and more of these processes are getting automated. The robotics technologies are getting so much better that you're effectively nullifying labor. So when you do that, uh, now rather than build my factory in China or build my factory in Mexico, I want to build it where my end consumer is, which is the United States. I want reliable power. I want reliable fiber networks. I want the infrastructure to be able to build my, my, um, 
my factory. So we're, we're seeing great demand in the manufacturing as well as great demand in the e-commerce. And I think one thing that I'll, I'll talk about too is a lot of times people think that e-commerce and retail are, are one or the other. Um, what, we've, what we're seeing, and obviously what you can see if you've been to Scottsdale Quarter anywhere recently, Amazon's opening retail stores. We're seeing omni-channel distribution. So gym stores are, are part of the overall supply chain uh, tied into the warehouses. It's not a warehouse or a store. It's, it's everything. And it's, it's how do you efficiently distribute the product from the warehouse, from the, ultimately from the manufacturing to the end consumer. So I think that's all going forward and, and we're, we're kind of in the midst of, of the ultimate consumer behavior and, and what ends up happening. Okay, well, thank you. Pat, I, I wanna pick your brain a little bit on this because the, Hugh and Rob and your company have really come up with a unique uh, approach to the multifamily development. Where, where are you seeing, you know, what changes are you seeing as, as you're moving forward based on your most recent experiences? Sure, and I, I think COVID has really, accelerate a lot of things that we're changing. And TJ just mentioned e-commerce and the, the growth of e-commerce. And what that means is more parcel delivery. Everyone is getting more things delivered. And this is a challenge that developers have been dealing with for a long time, but now they just, they, they have to deal with it. Where are we going to store everything that a tenant, a resident is getting delivered while they're at work? Is it in the main clubhouse? Is it in parcel storage? There's overflowing, I have photos of just overflowing property management offices just full of, of parcels. And it's it's the result of e-commerce getting to the end consumer. So we're dealing with that in our new projects. You know, how do we have more parcel storage? How do we allow for individual parcel storage lockers? That's been a, a fundamental shift. And I think it's long-term. I think it's something that we need to deal with uh, long-term. Yeah. We're also looking at the difference between public and private spaces. For the last decade, apartment developers have really built these wonderful public spaces, big clubhouses, big shared spaces, big open areas. And that's not resonating with tenants anymore. People don't wanna be in those big spaces. We have to take those big spaces and how do we make private, how do we make them private? How do we take the big public spaces and, and make them private? You know, for safety concerns going forward. So we're all, we're all dealing with that as, as developers for sure. What we're also seeing, and we build attainable rental housing, we're seeing the reemergence of the studio. For decades, apartment developers, they just weren't big on studios. Studios didn't underwrite, they didn't, you know, they just, they just didn't work. We're seeing tremendous absorption in our studios just tremendous absorption. They're attainable, they're the lowest priced new housing options someone can get into. We're seeing a lot of people that are moving out of a roommate situation. They're no longer comfortable living with somebody else. They want to have their own space. They want to drive into the apartment complex, walk upstairs, open the door, not go through any elevators, not go through any hollow hallways and be in their own space. Tremend I think that's a tremendous shift. The studios that used to be in the market that went out of vogue for decades you know, are definitely coming back. And then of course, we're, we're um, everything is online and virtual and people wanting to access everything through their phone. That's something that also accelerated in our industry. It was here and now it's just going forward like crazy. Everything has to be on your phone. Well, thank you for that thought. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't know whether this is an accurate uh, uh, statistic, but recently, I, and I'll say within the last six months, I, I read something that the over 60% of people over age 40 are living alone. So guess what? You know, studios work. They mm -hmm. do work. Thank yes, you. Yes. Yeah. John, um, you've, you've seen, I'm sure, uh, obviously you're seeing a tremendous de uh, demand for development uh, from the single family world. And I'm assuming that you're starting to see a real pivot in what uh, single family developers are looking for based on what their, their clientele is looking for. Can you address this? Sure, um, yeah, I would say I definitely know more about single family and multifamily than the other product types. And TJ has taught me a lot about industrial and I appreciate that. <laughs> I can actually talk a pretty good talk these days. Um, and then uh, Jim, you know, you're gonna continue to do great in your space with your uh, uh, just experience and, and being as smart as you are. So I think everybody's got a bright future. Certainly the single family has been driven uh, significantly by the low interest rates 
and uh, and I think that uh, tailwind is, is going to stay with us for quite some time. But the, as far as product type is what we definitely are seeing, and I'd, I'd say this is single family and multifamily, whether the uh, and then the, the blended deal in there is build to rent or, or single family for rent. But is uh, the the house has now become your office, uh, your classroom, your cafeteria, your playground. And uh, and so uh, I think people are rethinking the product so that it lives better for that type of environment, whether you're it's, uh, you're uh, living uh, alone or with a family. I think all those types of uses in the house or uh, or the residents are much more um, important these days. And then the last thing I said is, is plug any of those products into as much bandwidth as you can, uh, because I think that's you know something that 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 issue is here to stay as far as the benefits of, of having great uh, internet uh, and bandwidth access to to every type of product, but especially the residential. Okay. Thank you. There's uh, <laughs> this leaves leaves me to one. I've, I've got two more questions that I hopefully we can get to in our in our time frame here. The first though is. I always like the, I like bold predictions. <laughs> and I, I'd like to hear each of your bold prediction for our Arizona real estate for the next three to five years. And, you know, areas of change, areas of transi transition, areas that will ratchet back. Um, uh, Jim, what, what, what are your thoughts there? I think we're going to have a bumpy ride for the next six months. I think toward the latter part of uh, 2021, I think you're going to start to see that even out. Uh, hopefully the pandemic with the development of the new vaccines and certainly a different attitude uh, among all of us in terms of how we need to live safely, uh, you know, will we'll propel us into that latter half of next year in, 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 a, in a very good way. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to have a more stable political situation. Uh, that's going to help us all. Uh, maybe that's wishful thinking, uh, judging by the past election, but I, you, you have to remain hopeful. Uh, but I, I think, I think the, the most important thing is to really keep our eye on the ball in terms of really what's happening underneath our nose here in Arizona and appreciate that. You know, in retail, we kind of follow housing. You know, we lag about two years behind housing. Uh, conversely, you know, we'll still stay in business two years after housing drops off. Uh, so we keep an eye on the housing market, and that is uh, uh, that is it's it's been amazing to me uh, how we have grown how, how housing growth in this state, uh, manufacturing, and anybody that drives up and down the 303 corridor, you see a phenomenal happening up and down that freeway corridor. The jobs that are being produced, the, and if you think about it, that 303 and I-10 corridor. It's about, uh, well, maybe about a 12 hour round trip to greater Los Angeles. Uh, people would rather do business in Arizona, transport their goods over to LA, either for shipment to other countries or shipment within the United States. And that's where Arizona is really coming alive. Uh, let's keep an eye on the West side. Uh, I think the West side is really gonna blossom over the next couple of years. I mean, that's where we have our eyes on, you know, in terms of future retail development. So, you know, I look at the horizon and I, I think what we're going through now is going to be a relatively, and I underscore that word, a relatively short-term phenomenon. And I think uh, given another year or so, get this pandemic behind us, get people back to work, then I think, uh, I think this economy is gonna do very, very well. Great, thank you. Thank you for that thought. TJ, do you want to, do you want to weigh in on that? Where, where do you think we're going to be in three to five years? Yeah, so I, I, I think Jim said it great, and I would agree with pretty much everything he said. I think one thing that, uh, you know, he touched on that, that, that specifically, you know, towards industrial and manufacturing and that stuff is our state has been really forward thinking in terms of putting in great infrastructure with these freeways prior to actually 
you know, needing it 100%. So with the foresight of building the 303 and putting in great infrastructure with APS and SRP and building these, these power hubs and fiber networks and all that kind of stuff, I think we're really, really well positioned, especially in the West Valley, to attract some of these great users. I mean, you can see it with the announcement of the TSMC deal. You can see it with Red Bull, White Claw, all these guys that have gone out and, and Ball Corporation built these production facilities in the West Valley. I think so long as that infrastructure continues to, to get maintained and upgraded, which I, I believe it will, and, and so long as our, our policies generally stay business friendly, where we've got the proximity to the population density of, of California, but you don't have to deal with all the, the, the challenges of being in California, specifically as a manufacturer, um, I think we're going to continue to have great success. And I also think we're going to continue to have great success in the data center market. I mean, Microsoft and some of these guys have made these huge investments in the West Valley due to the fiber network, the power reliability, and, you know, those facilities can also serve California via the fiber networks, um, you know, along the freeway and the rail line. So I, I think we're really well positioned as a state to, uh, to continue to grow and to grow into what I would say is the growth sectors in the, di the digital age. But I think we need to make sure that we're, are, we're staying, uh, from a policy standpoint, welcoming to these businesses to continue to, to attract guys like this. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. John, you, I, I admire what you have done over the last, gosh, 30 years. You seem to be, you're like Gordy Howe. You skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it is. Uh, I'd like your perspective on you know what what you see in the next three to five years. Sure. So first and foremost, I'm incredibly optimistic about it, and a lot of it has to do with kind of the the way our state has been forever. That our forefathers, even before statehood, and their leadership on things like the reservoir systems, uh, obviously the, the CAP both water uh, projects as well as, as, as TJ said, just the, I think we're blessed with great infrastructure. And I think that's maybe our biggest strength uh, that we have. The, the what I think we're, we need to watch, and I, again, I have great uh, confidence that we're gonna figure it out because that's what we do here. But we have some very significant fiscal cliffs in front of us, including the expiration of uh, Prop 400 for transportation uh, infrastructure and then an education props one two three and three oh one so I think we've got some some big things in front of us that if we continue to execute as uh, as our uh, those that came before us have I think we're going to be uh, blessed with success uh, but uh, those are some of the things uh, that I would definitely we have to keep our eye on to, to make sure that the future is as bright as it has been in the past okay well thank you John Pat I think, Chaz, what I see in the next three to five years is that our state is going to become increasingly younger. I actually just looked it up this morning. I was curious, and, and you probably know the average age in Arizona right now is 38 years old. California is 37 and Florida is 41. So I see this state continuing to get younger. I think the state's going to continue to get more diverse. I, I, I do agree with the studies that say by 2027, Arizona will be a majority minority. Is that what you say? Or a minority majority by 2027? It's something we all have to, to understand. That's just, that's just coming younger, more diverse. I think we'll see more autonomous cars. I think Phoenix, Arizona is going to be one of the first places to really adopt the autonomous car technology. It, it, it is, that is significant to all of our industries. I think tourism is going to come back to, to domestically before it comes back internationally. And because Scottsdale, Phoenix is very much a tourist winter visitor sort of second home destination, we will benefit from that. You know, the city will definitely benefit from that coming back first uh, before domestic. I think we're benefiting now and we will always benefit from the work from home. And that's something that's, that COVID has really accelerated as well. We are, we on our project, I, I was surprised 40% of our new tenants are coming from other states. And people are saying, well, I can work from home. I can work from any state. Why do I need to work from expensive San Francisco or expensive New York? I can work from inexpensive Arizona. I think our state's really gonna benefit from that over the next three to five years, that's gonna continue. So in five years, we'll have a younger, more diverse, more autonomous driving uh, city you know, I agree with John, we've, we've got some challenges. Education in Arizona is absolutely a huge challenge. We all have to recognize that. It is 
holding back some sectors, whether you think we're 46, 47th or 48th, somewhere down there in the lower quartile of education in Arizona is not acceptable. I think that that's a challenge. And, uh, you know, just as always, you know, climate change is something that we, we have to address. I have to put it out there, but I'm confident like everybody else, I'm really bullish on Arizona. I think we're in a, in a great place. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. We've got 15 minutes remaining and this may be a challenge for my technological capability. As I think all of you are aware, I do have one, a significant one, but there, I'm going to try to bring up the chat box and see, okay. Let's see, type messages. I don't see, Sheila, am I missed something? I don't see any, any questions that have come in. So maybe we can continue with our other, other questions. Um, that, and I've got a few. Uh, Go ahead, Chaz. <laughs> okay, pardon me, say again. Did she say go ahead? We, have uh, we, we do have one question in the chat box now that you've probably ah, prompted. Uh, the, uh, this is with regards to recreational marijuana, is that correct? correct. Uh, will recreational marijuana have a positive impact on real estate? Pat, I'll let you start on that one. <laughs> I, I can interestingly speak to that because my, my other half of me is uh, from Vancouver, Canada. And as you know, Canada did legalize marijuana some time ago and it, uh, it, it did not have a negative impact. So that there were some people that thought it would have a negative impact on all types of real estate. It, 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 really, it, you know, it really didn't. It did provide more tax dollars. And in as much as those tax dollars were available for things like homelessness and education and just, you know, th that helps all real estate, but there was no specific negative impact on marijuana in that, in that situation. Okay. Uh, TJ, do you, I mean, do you have any grow facilities in your industrial buildings? No, we, we do. We do not have any grow facilities in our industrial buildings. I think uh, one thing I would say is is the what was passed with Prop 207 versus like a Colorado uh, is is completely different from an industrial perspective. So when Colorado legalized marijuana, there was a lot less regulation and, and not to say anybody, but basically you could go to Colorado, lease class C industrial building, open up a, a shop and do whatever. And, and you could get a license relatively easily. With Prop 207, it's basically converting the medical facilities to the uh, retail facilities. So from our perspective, we don't see um, too much changing in terms of an overall demand. It's not like a bunch of people are going to move here and try to open a whole bunch of new marijuana facilities. Uh, that's not the, the way that the regulation is set up in Arizona, and I think that's, that's smartly so. Uh, but what you saw in California and or some of the, I should say, Colorado and Washington, some of the early adopters was a more free market uh, approach, if you will. And that actually uh, benefits some of the industrial landlords, specifically the, the older class C type industrial product where guys, you know, that was outdated, guys would come in and lease that for that. But we, I don't think that's gonna happen in Arizona given uh, the regulation. Yeah, okay. Jim, do you have any thoughts? Well, I have mixed feelings. Uh, uh, you know, as, as TJ mentioned, our, uh, our enabling uh, initiative really uh, put the benefit on the current uh, medical marijuana users. So in other words, we're, by the passage of this initiative, we're creating a monopoly with the existing medical marijuana uh, retailers. And I think it ought to be more open. Uh, I disagree with some of the public funds or, that were being raised out of that initiative. Uh, where they're going, I don't think it's quite enough. Uh, but certainly, I think the whole decriminaliz decriminalization of marijuana or a lot of other drug categories. I mean, the so-called war on drugs just hasn't worked over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, just because we legalize marijuana, that's going to solve our drug issues. Uh, but there's got to be, there's got to be better alternatives uh, for treatment uh, than prison. And uh, so in that regard, I hope this really begins a new look at how we treat drug addiction and and the problems that are associated with um, uh, with addiction. So I'm hopeful for that. John? 
Yeah, so I mean, I, I didn't support it, but uh, I also don't have, don't have a lot of heartache with it, and I, I think it's a big neutral. I, I don't think it's going to impact things one way or another. Okay. All right. Here, thank you all. Uh, here are a couple of other. Uh, okay. Here, here's one. Um, this is a kind of an interesting one, and I think this is top of mind for a lot of people. Uh, with a large number of people working from home due to COVID, won't there be a negative impact on occupancy in commercial buildings and rents? And it goes on. There have been a number of articles, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I, I think that's that's the gist of the question. Large number of persons working from home due to COVID, won't there be a negative impact on occupancy and rents in commercial buildings? Uh, Pat, what, what are your thoughts? You know, that's not a space that we're in, a you know, commercial office. So I can only speak anecdotally that it seems likely that there will be an impact. You know, large companies like Salesforce are not going back for the foreseeable future. Lots of tech companies aren't going back to work. Uh, there, there will be an impact from COVID, but I think one of these other gentlemen that's more highly tied to commercial can probably speak better to it. Okay. Well, <laughs> TJ? <laughs> I know that's I know that's not your 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 bailiwick. However, I I suspect that you're you're you know you do feel the impact somehow. Yeah, I, I mean I think that that's one of the areas that is is kind of the, the biggest question mark to me in terms of what we were talking about at the beginning of consumer behavior and what changes. Um, obviously, for the the interim. Um, you know, it's it's tough to to social social distance in an elevator, specifically in vertical high rise office, right? So getting people in and out uh, in an efficient manner is is tough, uh, and and corporations, to Pat's perspective, are not feeling comfortable at this point bringing the full force back in. So uh, you know, I, I don't know what happens. I, I do think you know, just anecdotally, that Phoenix is in a much better position for office space than a, a New York, LA. Uh, San Francisco type market, just given our, our more spread out densities than uh, than cities like that. So I, I think we will see uh, a, a recovery there. I, I just, you know, I, I can't really speak too intelligently to to that sector, given that, that I'm not as familiar with it as the industrial. You know, I, I can I can tell you that for years, uh, the biggest uh, criticism of Phoenix, Arizona, Arizona and total um, nationally and from a development standpoint is that we are so spread out. Uh, that, you know, at one point I would say that our average height uh, of residential and everything is about one and a half stories. And in fact, now it seems to be working to our advantage. Jim, do you have any comment uh, on, on the impact on, uh, on commercial? Well, I think it would, it would have uh, an impact on office. And again, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, an office expert. I, I can just speak from personal experience. Uh, we li we live on the tenth floor of a high rise building, um, and uh, uh, we're the only tenant that's open on our floor. Uh, so there's a certain advantage to that when using the bathroom and things like that. But uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I mean, if that if that's a bit of a micro microcosm of what's happening out there in the real world, I'm I'm sure there will be an impact. How lasting it is, I'm not sure. Uh, I still think there's a need for interaction, and I think uh, you know people that I talk to are working from home. It's it's a mixed bag. Some people enjoy it, but some people enjoy coming into the office. So I I really can't predict any any long lasting trend as it relates to that. John, do you have a comment? I do. So I think the death of the office market is uh, exaggerated and definitely at a minimum premature. Uh, I think that's one that we just have to see what, what happens as, as it rolls back. But the one I would say, I think some of these things were happening already, but uh, you know, we did the Marina Heights deal for State Farm, 2.1 million square feet, and there's basically nobody in those buildings right now and won't be for a while. Uh, and then kind of a second whammy to that is that they, there are five buildings and they, uh, because of technology, they were already slimming their workforce and uh, didn't need all the buildings. So they sublet one of them to Carvana. Um, so I think the, the, between the, the health issues and probably more importantly, the technology advancements and it's kind of to, to TJ's issue on automation and warehouses is uh, there's gonna be you know, definitely uh, high value, 
a need for engineers, but for a lot of the more t traditional office workers and, and uh, warehouse workers, I think uh, things are going to definitely be tougher. And I think it, I think you're seeing this as, as you had mentioned in an earlier question that you seeing you're seeing a lot of your and you too, Pat. I mean, you're you're seeing more. Uh, more demand for people to stay at home and work, and maybe they're working a day or two or three days uh, out of the week from home. So, and I, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what impact that will have on demand for office space. Okay, uh, we've got about five more minutes, and let's see, I don't see any other questions, so I want to go back to my last question. Um, and I think all of you have already addressed this. Uh, in one fashion or another, but I'm going to ask it out. Where do we go from here? How do we make Arizona better? Pat? Oh, uh, gosh, I, th I, you know, I, I think I spoke to it. It, it is changing. Uh, we do need to address education. We, we absolutely. From a, from a housing perspective, the city of Phoenix just published a report that Phoenix right now needs 163,000 housing units. So there is a need for housing as a, you know, as a, a city and as a development community, we need to address that need for housing. Definitely need to address the need for housing affordability and the, the increasing homeless population. And one thing we all need to be aware of um, in the, at least in the apartment side is the, the uh, looming evictions, the tenants that are not paying rent but uh, we can't evict them because of either the CDC or other regulations. That's a tidal wave coming. And to me, it's not so much the, the evictions, but it's all of those people that are negatively impacted that now have damaged credit, that can't buy a home, that can't, can't do so many things that we're expecting them to do to help the economy get better. And it is a, we're kicking the can down the road on evictions and it, it's, we'll, we'll need to come up with a solution to that. Okay, okay. Uh, TJ. Where do we go from here? How do we make Arizona better? Yeah, well, I, I would agree with what Pat said, and, and I think I would tie on to what, what John had said previously. I think, um, you know, our, our state and our, our forefathers have done a good job of, of long-term planning with the CAP and with infrastructure and all those things. I think uh, continuing that and specifically continuing that for, for the digital age, right? Continuing fiber network build out, continuing power infrastructure, continuing freeways, continuing all these things that are, that are gonna attract these, these new technology manufacturing users to Arizona. Uh, is huge, and, and and that comes via you know increasing the education, working with great partners like ASU and U of A and NAU to to get these engineers out into the workforce and to graduate these engineers. I mean, obviously, we're we're very fortunate to have to have guys like Michael Crow uh, in this city to, that are that are doing such a great job with with education, higher education, and and getting a great uh, workforce graduated every year for these these type of jobs. So. I would say just just continuing, I guess what we've been doing historically and to your point and to, to everyone's point before is looking where the demands are going and where the, the puck is going in the future and, and setting up regulation and infrastructure to be able to sustain that. Right, thank you. Jim? Well, I'd certainly like to underscore what Pat said and that's education, education, education. You know, education is the greatest job creator that we have, you know, particularly for knowledge-based jobs. I know several years ago, we were worried about the Arizona economy. Is it going to become an economy of, of call centers uh, with, with lower paid workers? Uh, certainly, we've improved on that over the last several years, but we need to keep building up the foundation of our education infrastructure, both K-12 and also the, uh, you know, uh, our, our, uh, our higher institutions of learning. I mean, I'm a native of this state, and uh, when I went down to the U of A, as you may remember this, tuition was 150 bucks a semester. Yep. I and if you could afford that and a couple of pair of Levi's, uh, I mean, you could afford to go to college. I mean, kids can't afford that today. And I think that's that long term, that's going to really have a detrimental effect on our state. I'm also concerned about affordable housing. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly, as I said before, thrilled with the amount of housing development that's going on, but prices are really creeping up. And is it going to really price a lot of our citizens? out of the market in terms of, of, of affordable housing. Uh, I think we have to be mindful also, particularly when you're talking about a knowledge-based economy, how do our people recreate? 
we have to be concerned about preserving open space. I mean, John's had a history in terms of his involvement with the Nature Conservancy and where people go, you know, to get away from the metro areas. There are those, the, the unique qualities of our state that you find no other, no other place in the world. And we have to address that. Uh, so I guess it all falls under the uh, category of sustainability, uh, quality of life. And if we maintain that, we're not gonna have a problem with growth. People are gonna wanna come here. Uh, they're going to have, want to have their kids educated here. They're going to want to be able to recreate here and live here uh, with a family-based economy. So uh, I think if we pay attention, uh, keep our eye on the ball in terms of that regard, I think our future is going to be safe. John, very quickly, we've got... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just be very short. So I, I agree there with all the points everybody's made, but just one maybe summary from my perspective is I, I think the issues we need to focus on affordable housing, the inequities that we're, you know, we're all dealing with across the country right now, as well as the education system. And the bottom line is I think we need to treat them as investments. And if we invest today, it's, uh, it's way easier to deal with it and way cheaper to deal with it uh, in advance versus trying to mitigate it and, and mop it up later. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of you, I mean, your, your insights are terrific and I, I'm sure that our audience has really, really appreciated it. Thank you for agreeing to participate today and uh, I will see you real soon. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you later.